Welcome back. We uh, are now uh, officially in, heading into the uh, second half of the course. Have you ever had that experience of being offered either uh, presents and gifts or, or goodies and delicacies where uh, you were slightly overwhelmed? This is how I feel when uh, approaching uh, this section uh, in regard to what to study, you know, what to highlight. Um, there are monumental issues that affect the geopolitical landscape, uh, which are changing all the time in the region we're going to be taking a look at, let alone isolated American decisions uh, that are related to uh, this region that we're going to take a look at uh, here, Chapter 8, uh, Northern Africa and uh, Southwest Asia. So uh, you can turn to page 321 in your textbooks. Before, however, getting into uh, the actual material, let me encourage you to uh, download uh, the anticipation guide on our course page. Uh, this guide uh, asks you to make predictions about uh, what you think you're going to learn via the lecture. So, um, you know, when we finish the lecture, we'll go back and see how how um, savvy uh, you were, right? Uh, and, some, and from an educational uh, toolbox, the assignment acts as a motivational uh, tool, especially for those of you with a more uh, competitive nature, right? Uh, competing with yourself, you know, see how well you did. Uh, although these are not to be graded, uh, nor turned into me. It's just, uh, it's just that you know, motivation to zero in on the, the, um, the lecture. And as I said, as a result uh, of, um, you know, the nature of what we're going to be taking a look at, I'm always kind of in a quandary. Uh, as to uh, know what to highlight with the lectures and their subsequent readings and uh, videos and the DQ. Uh, because it, things are always changing uh, in this um, particular region. Now our textbook was uh, copyright 2012 and I had to uh, update several things just in the last year or two, as a matter of fact. Turn to page, I said 321. Let's go to 322. 322 as a map. And uh, we'll um, take a look at, um, like I like to do, some of the heads up terms, as well as um, where we're going to be heading in this uh, chapter. North Africa, Southwestern Asia, we want to point out why uh, the region is the world's uh, religious heart. Right, we'll take a look at that and get rid of that, uh, figure that F there. Why the region is the world's religious heart. We want to understand the importance of water politics in the region. We want to explain where and why Pan Arabia and Islamism has been effective. And we want to distinguish Jerusalem's significance in Arab-Israeli relations. I'm going to be touching on, I was looking at this, uh, these heads up terms, I'm going to be touching on just about all of these, not, not quite all of them, but um, the Middle East. The Middle East is what uh, you know, we've been known to call it, uh, the more uh, politically correct term would be Northern Africa, Southwest Asia, uh, monotheism, right, the belief in, in one God, uh, the diaspora, uh, AD 70, the uh, Jewish nation was um, dispersed out of Palestine by the Roman government, uh, Shiite and Sunni Muslims, the Shiite uh, Muslim is more conservative, more adherent to um, uh, Islamic law, the Sunni, more moderate, maybe secular. Calligraphy, um, this here is the art form 
uh, for uh, you know, much religious significance for the, the uh, Arab and, uh, and, uh, and Islam. Farsi, Farsi is uh, the uh, uh, language of, um, that you'll find in Iran, a Persian uh, language, OPEC. OPEC, very important concept, what, what, what we're studying in geopolitics, the Organization of Petroleum and Exporting Countries, basically oil cartels in this part of the world. And we'll take a look at uh, how much of the, the uh, world's oil <clears throat> is, uh, is found here. Pan-Arabism, Pan-Arabism, uh, this is a one, the idea of a one Arab state an idea that started in the 1800s, actually. Islamism, that's related to that, uh, politicizing Islam. Uh, the caliphate, the caliphate, uh, caliphate, uh, an Islamic state uh, under the leader of a, uh, a, a caliph uh, who is believed to be the successor of Muhammad. Uh, the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring heard a lot about that, um, you know, in the last uh, last uh, ten years or or so. Uh, the Arab Spring was um, basically an uprising in certain countries across North Africa, Southwest Asia, uh, for you know greater access to democracy, uh, upending some of the old guard. We'll take a look at uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of that as we, uh, as we move along today. Uh, jihad, jihad, the uh, holy war, holy war uh, against uh, infidels and um, even Arabs who and Muslims who are not uh, deemed um, serious about their faith. Uh, Khomeini, Khomeini, uh, the uh, religious leader out of Iran. Uh, Sharia law, Sharia law is uh, adherent to uh, the, uh, the Quran. It's a, a, a very uh, 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 arduous adherence to that based off of Muhammad's uh, works and writings. Medina, Medina, uh, historic. Uh, these are uh, named after the second holy city uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, after Mecca. Uh, this is based off of um, based off of that uh, city. And basically, what you're doing there is looking at historic sectors of some of your older uh, Islamic uh, cities. We'll we'll look at one of those illustrations. Uh, during the lecture. Uh, the Quran, of course, the um, historic or the uh, uh, religious uh, writings you know, of um, the um, Muslim faith. Uh, the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, a, uh, arguably a terrorist organization in Palestine uh, with the goal of uh, terrorizing uh, the nation of Israel and uh, with the goal of uh, aiding and driving um, the uh, nation of Israel out of uh, the region. The Hadith, um, I'm just looking over my notes. I'm really not going to, um, to be covering that at any length, but I'll just say this about it, uh, which is of, uh, of no small importance. The Hadith is uh, probably what most Muslims read uh, over the Quran. And it's basically like commentaries about uh, what uh, Muhammad said. Okay. So looking at your lecture model, let's take a look at uh, the first section here. And we're gonna get into cultural and political history of the region. Uh, your first blank there, the Middle East. The Middle East is a, uh, a Eurocentric term, meaning Southwest Asia, and it's the, as I said earlier, the culturally sensitive term. 
cultural and political history within a wider world. Uh, religion, uh, around 1000 AD, um, mono, uh, monotheism uh, dominated the region, Judaism, uh, and Christianity, and then 622 AD, uh, the beginnings of uh, Islam. Judaism, in AD 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, dispersing Jews uh, throughout with you know throughout the region and Europe, you know, otherwise known as the the uh, diaspora. Christianity, there were divisions over who Jesus was, and then over doctrinal issues, which split the church between the Orthodox Church, which found its headquarters in the eastern part of the Roman Empire in Constantinople, uh, which we looked at earlier in the course, and uh, the Catholic Church, right, the Catholic end of that in Rome. And uh, this split uh, occurs uh, in 395 AD and uh, to 1453 AD. Eastern Church, as I said, was in Constantinople, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Islam, Islam, the holy book, right? The holy book, the, the Quran, uh, which contained the words of Allah revealed to Muhammad. Your Shiites or your Shia Muslims, they comprise 90% of Iran and 60% uh, of Iraq. Uh, they are the more conservative. They are the more conservative of the two. Page uh, 330, on page 330, there's a, um, still some illustrations, there's some pictures there of Islamic architecture that you could take a look at. Let's take a look at the languages of the region. Arabic is spoken by about 50% of those in the region. The majority Muslim group is are the Sunni Muslims. Uh, it's based on the Quran supplemented by tradition. The Sunnis are the more moderate wing of the uh, Muslim sect. Uh, calligraphy, the most important art form, as it contains uh, religious significance of the Quran. Again, uh, page 330, you see also some uh, Islamic architecture. And then you have your Indo-European languages. They are very significant. Uh, the Farsi language, is the official language of Iran. Page 331 in your textbook, um, you have a map there for you of, uh, let's say, uh, language and uh, language family map, basically, that uh, you could uh, cross-reference in connection to uh, that uh, particular section. I want to briefly just cover climate and uh, as I do that, um, you can turn to page 326 and look at the climate region map. Um, you have arid climates uh, that dominate the region with um, you know, humid climates found uh, in the mountainous areas of northwestern Africa and Turkey, as well as the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, as a result, and this is important that I cover this too as we start to get into the water politics, as a result, water is obviously uh, scarce, a scarce commodity throughout the region and uh, human activity. Uh, whether agriculture or urbanization uh, is concentrated in uh, major river valleys and other locations where a significant amount of water is available. And you can see that uh, on the climate uh, region map. Uh, rapid population uh, growth has increased focus on the regions, some of the region's environmental problems. Uh, the most extensive uh, pollution problems are related to uh, salinization of um, irrigated agricultural land and the oil industry uh, pollution at locations of extraction and processing. Uh, getting back to the water salinization there, water, you have um, soluble salts that uh, accumulate uh, in the uh, in the soil, uh, the excess salt can hinder 
uh, crop growth as their ability to, um, you know, table up uh, water gets uh, gets limited. So this may be natural, and for the most part, it probably is, or it just could be because of uh, poor management uh, practices. Take a look at some of the uh, area as strategic. After World War II, Southwest Asia and North Africa became strategic in light of war tension with Israel, uh, the Cold War, and then just the huge demand for oil. Uh, page 339 gives you an oil resource map and along with a, a graph, which I think you'll find valuable in this study. Well, I think all these maps I'm telling you guys about and graphs are important to you know, all, all of our studies. Pan-Arabism. Pan-Arabism. This is united opposition. Well, united opposition to what? You might ask. Uh, the Arab League constructed in 1945 as a response to the creation of Israel. Initially seven nations, today it's 21 and includes the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the arguably a Palestinian terrorist organization. Excuse me. work. Hello? Egypt was expelled in um, 1979 as a result of an accord with Israel. Uh, headquarters went from Cairo at that point to Tunis in Tunisia. And then in 2020, uh, with uh, President Trump presiding, uh, the United uh, Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain signed accords uh, normalizing relations uh, with Israel. Some folks have felt that uh, along with President Trump stepping a foot in, uh, in North Korea, this here should have qualified him for a, um, a Nobel Peace Prize. Islamism. Political Islam's victory in Iran in 1979. The main success, the 1979 Islamic Revolution under Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. Uh, Islamic law, basically Sharia law, became official in Iran by 1983. And again, this is a sacred law of, uh, of Islam. Uh, extreme terrorism, has yet to yield much, uh, if, if anything. Oil resources. The Persian Gulf is believed to contain close to 70% of the uh, world's uh, oil resources. And um, here, I got the set of notes that I forgot to to uh, put in there, and it um, is related to the, uh, here we go, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and, uh, I skipped a point up here, uh, point four, the uh, ISIS, ISIS, ISIS looks to develop an Islamic caliphate. Interesting thing about this, interesting side note about this too. Um, during the Trump administration, there was an aggressive campaign to put that down and that was largely successful. But um, since we've all heard about ISIS, you know, during the last decade, during the Crimean War, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, during the Crimean War, Turkey, the old Ottoman Empire, which will be one of your videos, uh, was seen as weakening, and uh, the Russians were looking looking to take advantage of the old Ottoman Empire. And you can do a map study on this to see what I'm talking about. And 
the Western European nations, England and France, uh, predominantly were concerned about the Russians taking in, taking advantage of that, and they got involved and took down a, a Russian incursion. Hence, the Europeans ended up carving up that entire region. Uh, Iraq was one of them, uh, border issues. And ISIS, uh, a large part of ISIS's goal was to claim back all of that territory. And uh, if you take a look at, you know, ISIS's claims, and you, this is where I'm going with this, you juxtapose it with the old Ottoman Empire, you'll see that's what they, you know, the boundaries are almost, uh, uh, almost exact. And then the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring, a uh, revolutionary wave of um, demonstrations. Again, I'm going back up to point B here, Islam, Islamism. Uh, the revolutionary wave of demonstrations bringing down repressive regimes throughout the Arab League countries. Now, this went on from about uh, December of 2010 to about the middle of 2012. I would add two with mixed results. Some of the folks they toppled, uh, Hosni Mubarak of uh, Egypt, certainly no choir boy, but the, some of the folks that have replaced uh, some of these, um, you know, some of these thugs are perhaps worse, you know, when it comes to radicalism. And then in other cases, uh, just kind of looking at some Christian literature, uh, such as the Voice of the Martyrs, um, what has served to happen is greater religious freedoms, right, for uh, house churches, Christian house churches, and and uh, Bible distribution. So, you know, depending on how you look at this, uh, mixed results. Again, oil resources, I uh, got into the first part there. Uh, Persian Gulf is believed to uh, have uh, contain about 70% uh, of the uh, the uh, world's oil, uh, according to um, you don't have to write this down, but according to CNN Money uh, Money Magazine, uh, the U.S. does if you uh, factor in fracking, right? Fracking and uh, and uh, things related to that, the U.S. has, and uh, of course there's arguments about that, right? fracking under the Trump administration that was unleashed. Uh, arguably, we were for the first time uh, energy independent and, um, you know, under um, the Obama administration, I think within the first week, maybe the first day, uh, that was, um, you know, an executive order stopping the oil flow uh, out of the pipeline uh, out of Canada and uh, fracking activities which leads to the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. OPEC is a cartel. A cartel, it's an organization that uh, coordinates the interests of producing countries by regulating market prices. In other words, OPEC, right? OPEC, OPEC is um, headquartered in Vienna, uh, has uh, 12 countries. Uh, Algeria, Angola, you don't have to write this down, uh, Ecuador, uh, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Libya, Nigeria, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Venezuela. And if you notice, um, you can look at some of those countries and um, say that uh, or you could you know, surmise or uh, conclude that uh, not all of them are exactly uh, allies of the United States, which gets back into the, you know, the oil pipeline argument coming out of Canada and fracking. Um, a lot of, you know, Americans feel that that was the way to go. Of course, there were environmental concerns uh, uh, with that too, prompting President Biden to enact um, executive orders against such things. Water politics. Now we all we all know about the oil. Uh, one of the things that uh, probably doesn't uh, get as reported on here are, are the water politics, especially when you hear about the turmoil uh, in the region. And I would say this is uh, problem number two uh, for um, uh, issues between the 
between Israel and the uh, neighboring its neighboring states. Uh, water is not evenly distributed. Eighty percent of the region's water is uh, found uh, in the Nile and Tigris Euphrates uh, river basins. Okay, you can look at um, page three forty two. And there's an agricultural land use map there, uh, figure eight, uh, 817. Uh, and in the future, as I say here, in the future, water may surpass oil as the uh, critical resource in uh, southwestern Asia. Part of the problem there was when uh, Israel when, Israel, when Israelis began um, migrating into or emigrating into the area, emigrating into the area, it just began to strain the reader or the water resources even greater. So it became it became tension uh, for the neighboring Arab states, and then with uh, the emigration of um, you know, Jews into, um, you know, their uh, uh, believed promised land, um, it began to force some Palestinians out into neighboring countries, such as Jordan, for instance, and, um, and Egypt, and, you know, again, straining again, um, the um, distribution of water within those countries. Population distribution and dynamics. The uh, major cause of high population uh, is uh, is water distribution, right? Is water distribution, water availability. Again, uh, page three twenty three forty two. Uh, you can um, you can see that. Tunisia, as a result of all this uh, reduced population growth, uh, shortly after gaining independence, uh, maximum maximum age there for marrying family planning, uh, 1964, uh, polygamy was outlawed there. Uh, maximum age there is uh, 15 to 17 years of age for girls and 18 to 20 for the guys. Region's life expectancy is about 70 years. Only Iraq uh, dipped below 60, and that was be because of the wars last decade, the last couple of decades, war and deprivation. Urban patterns. Much of North African cities surround enclaves of uh, old trading and agricultural centers. You have high population densities, uh, high densities of homes, uh, uh, commercial premises and public buildings within these cities, uh, mark traditional small towns of the region, and their cultural medinas, which I mentioned earlier, named after the sacred Muslim city in Southwest Asia. Uh, these are valued for uh, social and structural fabric, <coughs> as uh, historical sectors. Page 346, figure 822, gives you a, a diagram of how these um, cultural, you know, cultural areas of the cities are, um, are constructed. Human rights, uh, literacy rates, 67% of men are literate in the region and uh, just 25 percent of women uh, and then uh, just an awful ongoing tragedy uh, in the uh, region the Kurds in uh, northern Iraq have long pressed for their own nation of Kurdistan and actually the Kurds spill over they stretch over in the Turkey and uh, Syria as well, page uh, 359, figure 825 shows you that, that area. And um, yes, they've long pressed for Kurdistan. 
Saddam Hussein, when uh, he was in power, um, not to be flippant about this, but I don't know how else to say it, in order to quell uh, uprisings uh, in northern Iraq, he would um, periodically invite nerve gas, nerve gases and mustard gases and that uh, up there uh, on the Kurds. And uh, the UN had um, several resolutions, um, you know, against him uh, to do this, uh, which um, propelled um, the UN-led invasion uh, back in 1990-91, uh, along with some oil issues in, in uh, Kuwait. And the world was, uh, you know, as a result of these types of things, the world was not in a whole lot of remorse to uh, see his um, subsequent demise, I think in 2000, 2004, somewhere around there at the hands of the U.S. military. Uh, just a couple of uh, things here before I finish up here with Israel and um, their issues, and we'll look at we'll, uh, X-ray Turkey and Iran. I just want to do, it's turn to page 350. Uh, many of the countries of Northern Africa have strong ties with France. Uh, Algeria struggled with a fundamentalist uh, Islamic insurgency throughout much of the 1990s, uh, and uh, after nearly three decades of supporting anti-Western anti terrorism, uh, Libya made significant steps toward normalizing relations uh, with Western governments uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Egypt and Sudan, you can turn to page 355, see an inset map there. Egypt and Sudan have many similarities, uh, most prominent being the dominant influence of the Nile River on all aspects of their society. While Egypt has a stronger and more rapidly growing economy than Sudan, uh, both countries have struggled with uh, internal uh, conflict and, and rapid population growth. And then page 359, um, the Arab Southwestern Asia subregion is a study in uh, contrast. Uh, there are substantial oil reserves but uh, most are concentrated near the Persian Gulf, as you can see that there on your map, and the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys in, uh, in Iraq. Now, while oil has brought enormous wealth to uh, many countries in the subregion, countries without oil struggle economically, so, uh, dovetailing into where I went ahead next, uh, Israel. Israel is uh, unique in the region on several levels. Uh, created by the United Nations for the Jewish people, the country has struggled throughout its existence with uh, political and ethnic conflict, or yeah, ethnic conflict uh, involving neighboring countries and the resident Palestinian population, which I've touched on. Uh, Israel is also economically distinct from its neighbors with a diversified high-tech economy. So let's take a look at that. Uh, page 366 and 367 and map 370 is a history of um, uh, modern Israel and also it shows you the kind of the evolving nature of several maps there of the bound the, the boundary of uh, the and the uh, also on three, page 370 more of an in-depth look at the controversial West Bank which we hear a lot about uh, in the news there let's take a look at this here Israeli and Palestinian territories um, Israel Israel proclaimed uh, Jerusalem as its capital in uh, 1950. Most countries, though, do not recognize this. Uh, and until um, December the 6th of, 19, or, or of 2017, uh, the U.S. did not. The U.S. was included in that. At that time, the U.S. officially moved in December of 2017 
moved its embassy out of Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is a problem, though, uh, in the overall picture. We'll get to that uh, in a few seconds. Okay, under the Trump administration, that uh, uh, the embassy was moved. Jerusalem's important for the Jews. Uh, for Jews, Jerusalem is the capital city of the, uh, you know, the nation of Israel, where King Solomon, King Solomon built, uh, built his temple. <coughs> Of uh, built his temple of Yahweh, and which was complete, completely destroyed uh, by the, uh, the Romans in AD 70. Uh, Jerusalem is also the site of the Western Wall. Uh, the Western Wall for is the last remains of the temples uh, that uh, David built, and it's also the city that Jews believe Yahweh God called his own. All right, so. You can see there the significance of Jerusalem uh, for the Jews. The significance of Jerusalem for Muslims. Uh, for Muslims, this is the um, where the Dome of the Rock is, the uh, where Muhammad, their prophet, made a religious journey uh, to the uh, to the heavens, and it's the site where Muslims believe their prophet uh, ascended uh, into heaven. In fact. And over on page, see if I can get it here, over on page three sixty-seven, I believe it is, there is a um, picture of the dome in a rock at the uh, the bottom of the page. I know on your readings on page three eighty-eight, three eighty-nine, I think there's uh, also uh, a picture of the dome in a rock, right? highly significant. And then the importance of Jerusalem for Christians. Jerusalem has always been significant to Christians because of the places there where Jesus ministered, and most importantly, right, uh, where he died and rose again. So I had said earlier that water politics are extremely important because of, you know, Israel's existence, draining water already, significant water resources. Jerusalem is a problem that uh, may never be resolved, you know, and certainly in our lifetimes because of these three issues uh, I just talked about, right? So, Turkey and Iran, I just want to set this up too uh, because this is kind of a complicated. Um, complicated section just to uh, barge in and do an x-ray on it. Um, Turkey and Iran, these are non-Arab countries located, and turn to page 372, turn to page 372, I want you to see the strategic location here. Um, they're located between Russia and neighboring countries and the oil fields of the Persian Gulf, right? So you get the picture there. Uh, they're rugged countries with long histories of dynastic rule. Uh, of the two, Turkey has much stronger ties with Western countries, being a member of NATO uh, and possible future NATO, uh, a member of uh, the European Union. Turkey has a diversified economy, but the Iranian economy is tied to its oil uh, oil production. Let's finish up here the lecture by looking at Turkey and Iran. Uh, political Islam. Political Islam's victory was in Iran. 1979, the Iranian Revolution took place, and you know, we got collected up in that. Hostages were taken. Before World War I, before World War I, Southwest Asia was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. Talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, which became modern Turkey. The historic rivalries between Turkey and Iran, uh, they uh, share a strategic location, which we just looked at, between Russia and neighboring countries and the uh, Southwest Asian uh, oil fields. 
in uh, the 1980s to 88 uh, Iran-Iraq war, Turkey supplied both countries with food and manufactured goods in exchange for oil. Since, um, since this uh, edition in 2012, you don't have to write this down, but since this edition, um, Turkey uh, has been uh, uh, in Ankara, the capital, has now been governed by uh, a uh, stricter uh, administration uh, toward Islamic rule, Islamic law, which is posing uh, some problems uh, for the European Union in inviting, uh, uh, giving Turkey an invitation into uh, the European Union and uh, stricter uh, subsequent uh, stipulations on Christian missionaries and, and so forth. So. There you have it. Take a look at uh, what's up ahead. A little something a little different. Um, something a little different here because of the nature of um, you know all the ongoing changes in this region, which I touched on at the top. Uh, you have your graphic organizer. Well, actually, before we get there, let's look at your um, anticipation guide. See how uh, kind of a wrap up to the lecture. Before we get into what's up ahead, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all originate in the North Northern Africa and Southwestern Asia. If uh, you had a um, uh, agree, if you agreed with that before the uh, lecture, you are correct. The only country where radical Islam has taken hold in is Iraq. That is not true, right? You should have disagreed with that even though you didn't know probably where it did take hold and we now know it was in Iran. Europeans are the reason for ISIS. If you said agree for that, eh, you know, that would be, um, that would be permissible. The Arab Spring was President Obama's work in bringing Arab nations and Israel together to talk about land uh, for peace issues. Uh, well, not necessarily, not necessarily. Most Muslims are Sunni Muslims. That is correct. If you have agree, you were right. The major source of contention between Arabs and Israel is water. That's a, a tricky question. Uh, if you said agree, that would make logical common sense. And it's a very important one, but because of Jerusalem, right, it is not. Jews were initially dispersed out of their holy land by the Arabs. Well, they were dispersed in AD 70, but by the Romans. This region contains about 70 to 80% of the world's, world's oil. That is true. An important minority in Iraq are the Sumerians. Well, that was the initial people group in Iraq. We looked at that earlier in the uh, semester, but it is, are the Kurds, right? The Kurds. And Turkey and Iran are in concert with one another in their war or uh, uh, war on terror against the United States. We don't know, right? Uh, we do know that uh, they are historic rivalry rivals, and we have some issues. So if you put uh, disagree for that, you would have been correct. So, and then getting back to the graphic organizer, you know, because of time, you can take a look at that. You have that. Your readings, uh, at least one of these uh, are going to be pegged to a DQ. I'm going to have, I think I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to definitely have uh, two discussion questions on there at the time I uh, gave this lecture. And uh, I'm giving this lecture and, um, you know, posted my sign up here. Wasn't quite sure uh, the direction I was going ahead with the DQs because of uh, some of the important issues here and what I wanted you to know. Um, I know I want at least two, but not three. Uh, you have your videos again. Um, uh, by the time I, you know, I was doing this, I wasn't sure uh, how many I wanted to include. Look at the course page, right, and look at the videos, and they're going to be important, as they always are, you know, to look at those short videos, include them in on your discussion questions. Thursday, right. Kind of the norm in the news that we do at midnight. 
And then uh, Friday, you have your initial post due, um, response post due on Sunday. And again, some of you guys, not many, some of you are not doing a good job of getting that initial post done by Friday at midnight. And you're, therefore, you're not getting the initial 10 points, right? You got good posts, good responses, but uh, you're not, uh, not hitting that stipulation there. Monday, we quiz, right, as always. And then we begin chapter nine. We look at a um, economically sad part of the world, arguably uh, the poorest area of the, uh, of, the, of the globe, Africa, south of the Sahara. So there you have it. Uh, any questions, comments, uh, don't hesitate to get hold of me Thursday night. Um, let me know if you want to debrief. And, um, get caught up on some things there Thursday night. If not, um, I'll talk to you guys next week. And uh, hopefully you guys have a great week and uh, do well in everything. So see you next time. Bye-bye.